I think it would be in the mood of the Spirit this morning just to have, give you opportunity to come in this moment and pray if you would like to pray, pray where you're seated. But I know there are a lot of heavy burdens that we carry. And sometimes we bury those burdens when we really need to release them. We really need to take them to the Lord. Not to our neighbors, not to one another, but to the Lord. And so I'm just going to ask Jordan if he would just play that course again. And if you would like to come and just take a moment to pray, we just want to pause in our service here just to present our needs to the Lord. So you come if the Spirit would prompt you. We present the struggles of life, the burdens we carry, the health needs that we have, relationship needs, financial needs. But Lord, our greatest need is to draw closer to you. Because as we draw closer to you, all of those things seem to fade. They fade in the presence of your power. They fade in the presence of your promise. And so, Lord, we lift up our needs to you, whether we do it at the altar or whether we do it seated in front of you. Lord, we present our needs to you. And, Lord, we leave them at your feet. May we not take the burden back and carry it, but, Lord, may we trust. And when the burden arises, may we remind ourselves that we've given it to you. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue to move and continue to work in the hearts of your people. We pray, Lord, that as we discover more and more of who you are, that, Father, our peace and our love and our witness will change in such a way, Lord, that you're glorified. Not that people would see who we are, but, Lord, that they would see who you are. And so, Father, we give you praise and we give you honor and we give you glory. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask it. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Sometimes we rush too quickly, don't we? And there are those times we just need to pause and we need to recognize that we're hurting people. We need to remember that life is full of difficulties and struggles. And I was reminded very deeply of that yesterday as I sat with a family who had just buried their 25-year-old son who was tragically killed in an accident. And, you know, it's in those moments that all of the little, all of the stuff that seems big becomes really little. Some of the times it's just the petty stuff in life that we allow the enemy to use to distract us. But it's sobering when you realize just how precious life is. And we only get one shot at this thing. And whether we get a few years or we get a lot of years, may we live them in such a way 
that we share the love of Jesus. That's, that's really what it's about. So I am um, glad you're here today, and I'm, I'm always praying that God shows up. Because if he doesn't show up, then we're just kind of, I don't know, we're just kind of here, you know. Might as well be at a sporting event or something, or, or uh, out on the Halifax fishing, which doesn't sound like too bad of a thing. But, uh, you know, there's no better place to be than in the presence of Jesus. And I've said it a few times, and I'll continue to say it. Nothing competes, nothing competes with the presence of Jesus. So, thank you, uh, Jordan. His first Sunday, um, leading us on his own. Great job. God's doing some amazing stuff, and I'm going to share a little bit of that as I continue our, our series today in the book of Acts. And today we're going to be looking at Acts uh, once again in the second chapter. And we're going to be looking at um, four, verses 14 through the end of the chapter. So just to take you back a little bit, um, as we've looked at Acts, we started a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, we kind of laid the foundation that we understand Acts is written by Luke. And uh, Luke gave account of the life of Jesus in the book of uh, Luke. And at the end of the book of Luke, he says, and Jesus ascended. And so when Acts starts off in Acts chapter 1, he talks about Jesus' ascension. And um, Jesus said that I must go so that the gift of the Spirit may come. And last week we talked about uh, the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the presence of Christ in, uh, or the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And, and I hope that you felt that presence here this morning. And today we're going to continue on, beginning with verse 14. And, and in, this, in this text, I've simply entitled, entitled it, What's the Story? What is the story? What is it that we're actually experiencing? What is it that is going on? Well, in Acts 14, Acts chapter 2, 14, we need to kind of understand what's going on there. But we also need, we need to have eyes that can see what's going on where we are. What are we experiencing? What are we going through, both corporately and, and individually? And so my, my first thing I want to share this morning is, is who are we and what's going on? So Peter, he, Peter comes. Now remember, the Holy Spirit has come. It's fallen on the 120, the 12 disciples, including Matthias, who at the end of Acts chapter 1, Matthias by lot is uh, chosen to replace Judas. So there's once again 12 disciples. And they are all together, and the Holy Spirit falls on them. And it says that they begin to speak in a language unknown to them, but known to the people. In other words, they spoke in known languages so that those people could hear the gospel in their own language. You see, people were gathered from all over the nation. They had come together for the Passover feast. And so they were there celebrating. And when the Holy Spirit came, the scripture says that it came with a loud roar like a, a rushing wind. And they saw what appeared to be tongues of fire fall upon them. And then they begin to preach. And we know in the scripture, uh, some said, wow, this is pretty amazing. What's going on here? These, these simple men from Galilee, they don't, they don't know our language, but yet we're hearing them in our language. And then there were others who said, yeah, well, they're drunk. And so, here we see Peter, he gets up, and the first thing that he does is he identifies his audience. Peter looks at them and he says, my fellow Jews and others who live in Jerusalem. He called to order. You know what he did when he identified? He said, hey, we're here. This is us. My fellow Jews and everyone else who lives in Jerusalem. And then he begins to clarify what was happening. He began to tell them exactly what was going on. He wanted them to understand that they were not drunk. He says, these people are not drunk as you suppose in verse 15. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. You see, there was some level of confusion. What is going on? And so Peter brings together. He reminds them that we're one people even though we speak many different languages. We're one church, even though we vary in age and experience and culture. We're one people. And so Peter clarifies that, and then he begins to tell them, here's what's going on. 
You'll find it in the Old Testament. The prophet Joel said that in the latter days, this is what you would experience. And that is indeed what is happening here. The Holy Spirit is upon us. I find it interesting that 2,000 years ago, the prophecy of in the last days, and I think every generation hears, these are the last days, these are the last days. I've come to this conclusion. These are the last days. (laughs) Our last day may not necessarily be when Jesus returns. Our last day may be when we go see Jesus. Nonetheless, it's the last days, and we need to live as such. We need to live our lives with a zeal and with a purpose that these are my last days. Because time is always of the essence when it comes to the things of Jesus Christ. And so Peter identifies those things. And I think it's important as as a church family to identify that, hey, we're here. A lot of different people, a lot of different places, a lot of different things going on. And our major focus over this past year is to try to bring the ministry together in unity. And I won't, I won't stand up here and tell you it's been easy and I won't tell you it's been perfect. At times it's been really hard, but I know God is bringing together. I see what God's doing and I wanna share some of that because in Brent's words, I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, but this isn't normal. The things that we're experiencing are not normal, which means They must be of God. These things just don't happen. But as we consider all of these things, one of our major focus, church, is is to fulfill and live the vision that was given to this ministry many years ago. And I say it, and you may get tired of it, but I think it's, it's, it's on me to remind us again and again that we have been charged by the Lord and given a vision to send out a thousand Christian young men and women to serve in whatever capacity that the Lord would have them. I found it very interesting as I was with this family yesterday to learn that this young man who had lost his life at one time had attended Warner Christian Academy. You see, we don't even understand sometimes how deep our reach is. We don't necessarily understand that maybe the things that we do in everyday life has a deeper effect on people. And one of our major focuses is trying to bring ourselves to where we're one ministry. We're not a church and then a school. We're one ministry. And it was on display this past week. Uh, this place was packed with our, our first chapel service of the year. And oh, I got a picture here. It's not a great picture, but, um, but you can see that the, the place is full with, with middle school and high school kids hearing about Jesus, experiencing church. It was exciting to see Pastor Jordan there leading worship for the young people. Some of them were worshiping, some of them were lost, some of them were clueless. And then Pastor Brent delivering an incredible message. He always does an amazing job. We're so blessed. Our focus is to minister, not just on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week and to touch these young people's lives and to see what God would do and how he would minister to them. Dr. C was sharing just a, a little story about a, 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 one of the students who, who went to one of the teachers and, and said, you know, I've never been to church. He was referencing chapel as church. And the teacher said, well, that was chapel. And he says, well, it's kind of like church, isn't it? And I told Dr. C, well, absolutely. It's just like church. Next week, we'll take an offering and then it will be church, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to understand. We need to keep it in front of us. We need to remember that there's a lot of things going on that we don't always see. And we want to do our best to keep you aware of those things. One of the things that's just been um, really just mind-boggling. So as as Sarah had shared, um, she signed up for a year. And she has been, uh, I think, trying to retire for quite some time. Now, what she calls retirement is is slowing down a little bit, okay? Um, The exciting thing is, is she is so, um, as we began walking through this process a year ago, it's like, you know, we, we really need to honor her and and we really need to, to try to see if we can find, um, someone who can come in and, and take us to the next place, to the next level with her on the team, um, her part of it. She's, she's not leaving us. She's not going to, um, she's not retiring. She's going to stay at it. And that's so exciting. And, and so, you know, we've, we've had some interviews and, and 
I've actually had a couple of interviews and uh, one I was real excited about about a month ago. Maybe it's a little bit longer than that. And, and I thought, ah, oh, this is it. Now, I want to I wanna assure you, church, that, that we're looking like we're getting top heavy. Well, how are we, how are we going to be able to, to steward our resources in such a way with, with all of the people that God is bringing to us? Well, I want you to understand, we are. We're 100% within our, our approved budget. That's just a little side note, because sometimes those things pop into our heads. Who are we? Who are we? What's going on? Well, I, I want you to know that, that um, everyone is... is supplementing their income. They're working in more than one place. Kind of a, a Paul model. He, you know, he made tents and, and didn't want to be a burden on the church. So, so that's how we're able to do this. And so we have just a small, small um, financial package, um, if you want to call it a package, but just a small salary that we've set aside very part-time for a children's pastor. And so I've, I've met and I, I thought, I thought this, 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 is the, this is the person and and uh, after about a week of praying, we both came to the same place. It's like, no, no, it's, it's, it's not the right person, not the right time. And, and, um, and so Kelly and Polly Barkle, you might remember Kelly. Um, Kelly was the one that spoke, I don't know, six or seven weeks ago. And um, one time, or one man one time, if you remember, um, guy full of, full of energy. Just um, Kelly is, is, is one of those people that in the grocery line shares Jesus and wins people to Jesus. Well, Kelly and Polly um, are an amazing couple. And, and the weekend they were here, they were actually um, kind of just feeling out what they were sensing in their spirit that God was calling them to Whitechapel. Well, all along I'm focused on Kelly and I'm thinking, well, I don't have a position and I don't have any money. Actually, we have lots of positions of leadership, but, but we, we, we can't offer you that. So Kelly and Polly live in Valdosta, Georgia. And um, here's how they got there. I want to share this story because I, I met Kelly and Polly 17 or 18 years ago uh, through my role with State Ministries, and I oversaw church planting. And uh, they were going to be planting the church. And so um, our state pastor at the time asked me to meet with them, and he gave me uh, the parameters of, of what we could do, and it's pretty impressive. So I met with Kelly and Polly, and, and I said, well, here's what we can do. Over three years, we'll... we'll support you in these ways. We have this support system. And, and then from a financial sense, we will give you $50,000 a year, a total of $150,000 to help you get this church planted. I did such a good job of selling them on planting the church in Florida that they went to Georgia for zero money. <laughs> well, see, it really wasn't my job to sell them. My job was to say, Here, here's what we can do and explore. I was so impressed when, they, when they, Kelly called me and says, you know, we feel like the Lord's calling us to, to Valdosta to plant a church. We don't know anybody there. Uh, we just feel like for some reason that's where we're supposed to go. And, and so I asked him, I said, well, you know, what kind of support system? And he said, none. Um, not much of a structure in the state of Georgia for us. And I said, well, how much finances? And he said, nah, none. Um, and I'm like, wow. You see, you really know when someone is following the Lord when they take the harder path not the easy path. It's been a lot easier to say, you know what, let's go here because we, we might be more successful. But you see, their dependence is not upon what man can give them. Their dependence is on the Lord and what he would give. And they went to Valdosta, Georgia, and they planted a very successful ministry there. And over the years, it grew up. And um, today, they have what they call Wintersville Community Center and uh, Wintersville Church. And, and so they're there, and he has a CrossFit gym there. Um, I looked it up earlier today, 290 members, probably one of the top two or three in the nation, doing an amazing work. Uh, they have church on Sunday, I think once a month in their CrossFit gym. They have classes. They, he's doing all of these things through the relationships of, of being with people. Pretty amazing thing. And so they came and we talked and, and um, I honestly, I just dismissed it. I said, this is insane. There's no way that anyone would consider moving for what we're offering from a financial sense. About three, four weeks ago, they called and said, we want to talk again. I said, okay. So we had another conversation. They came here during the mid middle of the week and, and uh, we met and we talked and, and uh, Polly says, I feel like God's telling me we're supposed to be here. But Kelly was like, eh, I'm not so sure. I said, well, let me remind you, uh, just make sure we're clear, you know, uh, uh, here's what we can do, and really, here's what we can't do. And uh, so, 
Long story short, uh, about two weeks ago, they called and um, they said, we feel like we're supposed to come. And I said, really? I had, I had totally dismissed it once again because it, it doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense at all. You would leave where you're at. Now he's gonna keep his CrossFit gym and he'll go back every couple of weeks. They had a couple of requests. He says, can we use the weight room? And can I start a little CrossFit gym out of there? And I said, sure, you know, hey, you know, that's awesome. He says, and, and here's his heart. He says, and, and my hope and my prayer is that, that I can generate enough income that I can then become a blessing on the church and pay you rent for it. And I'm like, geez, I'm just, uh, I just want you to make a living, you know. I just want you to feel secure. That's not normal, church. It's not normal. We're so blessed to have Jordan here. And the way that came about wasn't normal. We haven't advertised these positions. We've just simply prayed and we've simply talked to people. Didn't put it out on all the websites and social media. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We just never got to that place because God was answering prayers in his time. And I think that's an amazing thing. And so on September 8th, it's actually three weeks from today, they'll be with us. Polly will, um, she's coming to serve as our children's pastor. And Kelly, he said, I don't need a title. Now, they're both ordained pastors, just so you know. Kelly says, I don't need a title. He says, it's always been our dream that we would be in our church that had a school. He said, now hear this, the guy's, the guy's ADD now. He's all over the place. He says, I just can't wait to get there. And he talks with a little bit of a southern ghetto, okay? He says, I just can't wait to get there and high five those parents as they're bringing their kids to school. And I said, well, I can't wait to see you do it. Uh, you know, so that brings an excitement. Where are we and, what, and what's going on? Lord, what is it that's going on? But I want you to understand this. I want you to know this. Where the, where, the, where the work of the Lord and the move of the Lord is happening, the enemy doesn't take it quietly. And he is attacking. He is attacking. But greater is he that is in me than who is he who is in the Lord. Every morning when we're worshiping here, I focus on this right here. I have a great view of it, but this stained glass window with the cross and Jesus standing there to get my mind to the place saying, that's what it's about. And my prayer is that, that you don't see anyone up here except you see Jesus, that you see the cross, that you see what he has done. That's what it's about. It's not about any of us. Remember the words now. Whenever it becomes about me, it's no longer about Jesus. It's about him. That's what God is doing and as we continue through this, the other thing I want you to, to know is, uh, well, let's look at the journal reflections because I really think this is, this is important. List out the places where you identify and connect with our church family. It's easy just to come and be still. It's easy just to come and get. It's easy to come and receive. Follow Connor's example of finding those things that God would have you to do. It's fulfilling. It's not work. It's not a job. It's, it's fulfilling. Where do you connect with our church family? And ask the Father what role he has for you and begin working towards it, becoming a part of what God is doing. Another thing I saw as, as I read this text is, is we all have a story. And so Paul or Peter, as he's, as he's talking to the people, he says to them, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. We all have a salvation story of some type. Some of you are pre, might be pre-salvation. I'm just going to say it that way. You're working towards giving your life fully to Christ, accepting him into your life. But our story actually starts before we actually make a commitment to Christ. I don't know if you realize that, but, but it's, it's a pre-salvation story. It's a pre-discipleship. Discipleship actually, actually begins way before we accept Christ as our Savior. And so we all have a story. And what I'm amazed at is some of the stories that I'm beginning to hear. It's like, wow, there's a lot of stories sitting in this place. One of those, one of the, the stories that's, wow, it's, it's off the charts crazy. I'm just going to put it that way. It, it's, it's, it's a story that I got to hear this past week. This is Charlie um, today is, is um, all about our sound booth and sound techs. Charlie is, uh, runs our, our camera, and um, 
he came, oh goodness, early part of uh, the summer, and, and uh, he said, I, I, I want to do this. He purchased the equipment. He probably wouldn't want me to tell you that. He says, Pastor, I, I want us to have the services, not just in audio, but video. And then he created a YouTube channel, and, and, um, and so that's his ministry. I'm going to read some words from him in a few minutes. And then I, I, I heard he had an amazing story. And so this past week, we got together, and, and I, I will probably fumble this up a little bit, okay? I, I took notes, um, but I have really bad handwriting, so bad that I can't even read it sometimes. And um, I was writing fast because he was talking fast. And, um, but, but Charlie Doe, Charlie is a Viet, was a, he's from Vietnam, and he was a Vietnamese refugee. And he began to tell me his story. He said that, he was saved at a young age. His father made an acquaintance through business. His father then sent him, and this acquaintance was a pastor. His family was Buddhist, and so he was raised in a Buddhist home. He went to this Christian academy, and it was there that he gave his life to the Lord. How old were you then, Charlie? Uh, he was a young kid. I was, I was thinking it was in here, but I don't have that. But anyway, he, at a very young age, he, he gave his life to the Lord. And then as, as time would pass, things became very difficult for him. He wasn't safe. And at the age of 25, he's a Christian. He's serving in the church. He's doing all the things he knows to do. But he begins to try to escape to get out of the country. And for five years, he would try to escape. He gave large sums of money. You know, this is all black market stuff. He got ripped off time and time and time again. He said, I came to the place where I didn't have any more money. But at the age of 29, in 19, or actually at the age of 30, in 1988, Charlie followed through and was baptized. But it was a turning point in his life because he no longer had the ability financially to try to escape the country. And he said, I began to take, I took my toolbox and I went out on the streets and I would fix bikes, motorbikes, whatever, for anybody that I could to survive. Trying to save up some money. One day as he was fixing someone's bike, a conversation started. That conversation led to an opportunity for him to escape. I was thinking more about that, and, and, and you'd have to think in that moment, you don't know if that's a safe place or not. You don't know if you're being set up. But he was at a place where if he wanted to escape, he had to be willing to risk. And so he did. And through that whole, that whole story, I'll tell a little bit of it. He was picked up at 4 a.m. in the morning a few days later and he was transported to a little small boat. He said, we got on that boat, there was a few of us and they, they took us to a remote place and he says, we got out of the boat and we were in the jungle and we laid in the jungle all day long until night came. And when night came, a, a little bit larger boat came and that boat came and picked them up and, and for hours they traveled on this boat until they got to the ocean and there was anchored a big ship. And the ship had an automatic machine gun on it. Now in that moment you have to think and wonder, huh, are they gonna use that on us? But they didn't. He got to the boat and he said it was about a 30 foot um, Climb to get out of the boat. They threw a rope over and all they could do was climb this rope. Got up in the boat. He said there were three sections. There were about, um, I think he said 250 others in three compartments in the hull of this boat. And one of the dangers of escaping is obviously being caught, but he said the bigger danger were the pirates. 50%, he shared with me, of the refugees 
were killed by pirates. They would find the boats, they would kill the men, and they would take the women and children, and they would turn the women into sex slaves, and probably the same with the children. At one time, he said there were four pirate boats following their ship. But this old dilapidated, old Navy retired ship with a machine gun mounted on it that didn't work provided protection for them. And they would get behind that machine gun and they would scare them away. You see, you see the way God works? It's, just, it's an amazing story. And so he, they're on this boat, this ship for quite a while. And... Um, he ends up in a refugee camp. That was Malaysia, wasn't it? I don't know how well you can see that, but that's not great living conditions, is it? A tough place to have to live. And he was there for quite a while, and while he was there, there was a church. Would you look at that? I was complaining this morning because the air wasn't cold enough and it's pretty warm up here. He told me when he was living in this refugee camp, he suffered rat bites. Mosquitoes were horrendous. The living conditions were, were not humane. But in the middle of that place, there was a cross. And he began to serve in that church. He began to dream of the day when he would leave and he entered that refugee camp in 1989 and it would be 1993 before he got out. This guy sitting back there filming, this was his life. He has a story. It's an amazing story, but through the whole journey, he, he served Christ. He said those five years went by real quick because he was, he was serving. It went by quickly. And I love this picture. He's not a model. He says, this is me dreaming that I would one day get out of that refugee camp. He was seeking political asylum, but it was very difficult to get. He said, I was dreaming that one day I could get to America. One day I could, I could have a life free from the fear of the political pressure that he was experiencing. From there, he ended up in a um, a transfer. He finally did get that. And he ended up in a transfer camp, and and I know I know I'm slaughtering this, but I'm doing my best. Um, he's in a refugee camp for six months, waiting. This is him dreaming again. <laughs> for six months, he was never allowed to leave the compound of that fence. But then the day came, and this is the picture. By the way, those pictures of the refugee camp, he had to buy those. He wasn't up there taking them with his cell phone, okay? None of that stuff. This is Charlie with his papers with the American flag behind him, being granted access, political asylum access to come to this country. He landed in Houston, Texas, and he spent a year in Houston, Texas. It's where he had an uncle. He had to have a sponsor for a year when he entered the country, and so his uncle sponsored him for a year. And he was with another refugee friend, and the refugee friend had family here, and so they moved to, he flew to Orlando, and then eventually came to Daytona Beach where he operated, managed a video store for his refugee friend. If you eat at Rossi's, that used to be the video store where he worked. He said, my very first week, I had to find a church. He said, I came to White Chapel and I've been here ever since. We don't know each other that well. We don't know each other's stories. It's easy to come into this place and to coexist. But you know, really, understanding the stories and sharing our stories is so much a part of doing life together. Life events shape our story, but God transforms it for his glory. I can't imagine the fear of being in the hull of a boat. I can't imagine living in a refugee camp in those conditions for five years, praying every day and waiting. He told me, he says, I get up every day and I thank the Lord 
for the blessings. You see, for those who have been through much, the blessings are that much more. We take for granted, I take for granted, so much, so many of the blessings that we have. What events have shaped your life that others might identify with? You see, it's those points of identifying with each other that we can help each other, that we can walk through life together. Ask the Lord for opportunities to share your story with others who it might encourage. That's what being a family is about. It's sharing our stories. It's not glorifying sin. It's not glorifying what we've accomplished. It's, it's pointing one another to the one who leads us and the one who guides us and the one who takes care of us in Jesus Christ. What's your story? We, we all have a story, and our story is unique to who we are. But I want to tell you this, our story should always, always, always be in the shadow of the gospel story. It should always be in the shadow. So as Peter's talking to the people, he begins to tell them, this Jesus that you crucified, he rose from the grave. He began to tell them all about the story of Jesus. They were focused on these 12 men and, and the others who were speaking in languages that they understood. They were focused on what they saw come out of the sky and what they heard. They were focused on all of those things. And Peter turned their attention from their story to his story, the gospel story. Our lives and our stories live in the shadow of his story. And I know this, I know that some of our stories are really difficult. And in our stories, oftentimes, it's hard to see the gospel story. It's hard to experience that because we're so overwhelmed with what's going on in our life, and it's real. And the enemy, the enemy wants to still kill and destroy and take all of that away from us. But if we focus on the gospel story, and our story is always in the shadow of his story, so that it's not ever about us, but it's always about them. And Peter shared the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of it. Sometimes we complicate things way too much. It's the simplicity of the gospel. As I was sharing to about 300 people at this funeral yesterday, most of them were young people. And it was really a place where I didn't really identify. <laughs> I'm not 25 anymore, and um, we had a time of open sharing, and I didn't know you could say those words at funerals, but some of those words were, it was just like, wow, this is, this is way out there for me. And I realized that if I wanted to share the gospel story, I had to share it in a, in a language they understood. I just preached this last week. And so when I get up, I'm going to share the story of Lazarus. And I, I almost said, in the book of John, chapter 11, and I thought, they have no idea. It was evident they had no idea. And I simply said this. I said, you know, when Jesus, who was the Son of God, was alive and walked this earth. There were four men who, who wrote an account of Jesus. And this one guy, John, he was one of his disciples. And these are the things that he witnessed. You see, we have to tell the story of who Jesus is. And in the midst of, of, of grief, in the midst of the entanglement of sin, in the midst of, of our confusion, the gospel story, the simplicity of it, he died for us. He rose again. He stands at the, at the right hand or sits at the right hand of God and he prays for us. He makes intercession for us. And he sends his Holy Spirit to guide us. That's the simplicity of the gospel story. In that we have all that we need. It's all there. And so take time to reflect on the gospel story so that you can share it. We can't share what is it really ingrained in our hearts? And I want to end with this. Our story is still being written. It's still being written. And so as, as Peter talks, he says, there's many other words. He warned them. He pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 people were saved that day. But you know what we really got to remember here is save ourselves from this corrupt generation. It's corrupt. 
Our story doesn't end with accepting Christ into our life. That's where it begins. And our stories are still being written. And I know God is writing a story in your life and I know God is writing a story in the life of this ministry. It's not done. There's still story to be written. There's still life to be experienced. But your story needs to be known. So what's the present, present narrative of your story? Is it growing? Because here's the thing, if, if we're not growing, then we're dying. Now, I don't know if this, I was taught this um, somewhere along life that every seven years, every cell in our body um, reproduces itself. But I don't think that's true. Is anybody, any smart people here? Where's, where's Dexter? Is that true? You're a smart guy. You don't know. Well, if Dexter don't know, I don't know. Dexter and Sue right down here, wonderful couple. Get to know them. Um, they're new to our, our family and they're great people. Um, he's got a doctorate. That's why I ask. I like to ask people smarter than me. Um, I figure it's not true because if I'm a brand new person every seven years, why do I look like I'm so old? You know, it's just like, yeah, I'm sure there are cells that we're, we're constantly, cells are dying and new cells are being born. But, but here's the point. If we're not living and growing, we're stagnant and dying. That's, that's what happens. What happens to a pool of water when it begins, uh, when it's no longer moving? It becomes a puddle, it becomes stagnant, bacteria grows, but water that's flowing is always pure. What can you do to enhance your spiritual growth? Oh, I got it. You can join a discovery group when they launch in the second week of September. How about that? <laughs> I really believe that the key to, to being all that we really can be in Christ is being together, sharing our stories, laughing together, crying together, doing life together. It's easy to isolate ourselves, especially in the world that we live in today. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. Because when he can isolate us, we're more vulnerable. But when we're surrounded by the body, we're protected in ways that we wouldn't be protected otherwise. And so my prayer, church, this morning for us is, is that we would experience all that God has for us. That we would continue to discover Jesus. That's why that means so much to me is because, honestly, I, am, I have discovered more in the last few months than, than I cared to discover, but it's, it's been good. It's stretched me. It's, it's challenged me. Um, hard moments, great moments, but it's the discovery of who he is, and it's always about him. So long as we keep Jesus at the focus point, we will, we will have victory. You believe that? We believe that? Yeah. Some over here. Do we believe that, church? Yeah. yeah, that's better. Let's stand and let's just pray, and we're going to end with a song as we go out today. Father, thank you that you are a God, a God who knows every need that we have. Lord, that you're a God who meets every need that we have in your time and your way. But, Father, you see the bigger picture. Father, your story is our story. Our story is still being written because of your story. And so, Father... May we lean to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that we could experience, Lord, that which you have for us in Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen.